a share, and uh, then he'll he'll draw it to a close. And we're going to start Second Timothy. Yes, we're going to start Second Timothy a week after uh, next. We've seen in this series uh, the Christian faith that Christ constantly saying how exclusive the Christian faith is. How exclusive the Christian faith is. I am, he says, and there is no other. Last I spoke, I spoke about Jesus as the gate. And in that, our settings are completely different. In that setting, he was speaking to the Pharisees, those who thought they were the spiritual religious leaders, but Jesus said they were blind. And he said, you're false because you haven't entered through the gate, me, God. It was a rebuke, a rebuke to the Pharisees. This time, it's an encouragement, an encouragement to his followers. Today is not a confrontation, but a comfort. In fact, this is the last time that Jesus will actually speak to his disciples before he goes to the cross. And what's happening here is Jesus is trying to comfort them in the midst of the knowledge that their Messiah is going to be leaving them. I want to start with a question. And that question is on the next slide, which is not coming. I got to turn this on. There we go. Now it'll work. Um, the question is, how do you find peace when everything around you is crumbling? How do you find peace when everything is crumbling around us? Students who are looking forward to the next uh, semester, but their scholarship is pulled. And they can't afford it. And they don't know what to do. They, they're scrambling to try to find a school that will help support them. Parents who, who, um, whose children are lost and wandering. And, and you've, you thought you've raised them so well. But, but now they're not with the Lord. And, and you don't know what to do. If you have parents who are aging and dying and in, the, in that process and your world is just changing, it's being rocked and, and you just don't know what to do. Where do you find peace in those situations? In this passage, Jesus has told his disciples, I'm leaving you. And their world is in chaos now. Having caused them not to have peace, he turns around and tells them, have peace. In chapter 12, verses 32 to 33, he, he, sets, he begins to talk about this really openly. And in, in chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, uh, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And, and we know that the crowd, this isn't just in front of his disciples, this isn't in front of the crowd. And we know the crowd knew what he was talking about because it says, the next verse says, the, so the crowd answered him. We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that son of man must be lifted up? What do you mean that the Christ isn't going to remain forever? What do you mean that the Christ is going to die. We don't understand. It doesn't fit with what we believe the law says. So our setting is, next slide, there you go, is we're in the upper room. It's the Last Supper. We're, we're celebrating communion, uh, which is very apropos. And Jesus is giving his final words to his disciples they're sitting around they're having dinner by the way my first thought that came to my mind as when i got this picture and started thinking about this is how cool would it be to sit around and have dinner with jesus huh so but this was not cool because his disciples are concerned the disciples are 
concerned. The, the disciples are concerned. Uh, to, to put it lightly, they have left everything to follow Jesus. They left their families. They left their business. They were, you know, in those days, you took over the family business. They left that security. Uh, they've invested everything to follow the Messiah, who, according to the law, will last forever. But now Jesus is telling them, I'm going away. And actually, on top of that, he's saying, I'm going away, and where I'm going, you can't come. Now. The disciples were like, wait, what? We've sunk everything into you, Jesus. You can't just leave us. But that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was preparing his disciples for his death. This conversation, this whole upper room thing was preparing his disciples for when he would leave. Because within or less than 24 hours from this today's talk, he was going to be in the tomb. He was going to be dead. And he needed to prepare his disciples for that, uh, for that time. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would use this talk. You would use the, the scriptures, the preparation that you blessed me with, that you would use it to glorify your name. I, I pray, Lord, that, that hearts and minds would be encouraged, would be challenged, possibly would be changed today, Lord. It is for your glory that we are here. In Jesus' name, amen. Um. Jesus was actually in the upper room from chapter 13 of John to chapter 16 and into actually into chapter 17. So three plus chapters is covered this one meal, this one time together. It's a pretty big deal, according to the uh, author of John. We are going to look at uh, chapter the first part of chapter 14, and we're going to actually start with chapter 13. We're going to look at three questions by three different disciples about what in the world is going on here, Jesus. First of all, Peter's going to ask a question, which is kind of covering the thoughts of all of the apostles, the disciples. Um, then Thomas is going to ask a question, and then Philip's going to ask a question. And we're going to look at the, this from those three perspectives. So in chapter 13, the, some big events happen. First of all, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Then he says, um, Jesus, uh, there's someone going to betray me. In fact, you guys are all going to walk away from me. He gives a new commandment to love one another. He says, I'm leaving. While I go, you need to love one another. Because when you love one another, everyone will know you're my disciples. And then there's that fateful time when he tells Peter that you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. So in the upper room. Next slide, please. Um. They're all in this upper room. And Jesus is giving his farewell discourse. And he says, here's some instructions. He says, I'm on my way out. John 13, 33. He says, I'll be with you just for a short more time more. He says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Then he says, here's something important that you need to hear. Love each other. It says, love one another in the same way that I've loved you. Love each other. This is one of Jesus' last straight teachings to the apostles. You're to love each other because through loving each other, everyone will know you're my disciple. And Peter's like, 
did you just say you were leaving? He missed the whole teaching about loving each other. He says, did you just say you were leaving? And how come I can't, can't come there with you? As teachers, we know this, this happens often. You go through a great lesson, and then you have two or three people saying, where am I supposed to put my name on the paper? <laughs> if, so, yeah. Uh, so Simon, this is what he said. He says, Lord, where are you going? He says, Lord, why can't I follow you? I'm willing to lay my life down for you. Why can't I follow you? And he was expressing the concern of all the uh, disciples at that time. They're devastated. The dis disciples are devastated. Their world is falling apart. Peter's, like I said, is expressing this, this concern. They're all feeling this sense of abandonment. Their sense of betrayal, of confusion, of disappointment. And in all of this, Jesus says, let your hearts not be troubled. Let your hearts not be troubled. Believe You believe in God. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Now, in this section, oh, there's so much. We can't hit it all. There's so much here. I would really encourage you to spend time in chapter 14 of John. It's such a key chapter. So, in response to the disciples' distress that Jesus caused, he's saying, have peace. Settle your hearts. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. Actually, grammatically, this is in the emphatic, in the, I'm sorry, imperative. So he's kind of commanding them. Settle down. Have peace. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe me. I think because that word for believe is pastuo. It's also the word trust. So I think that makes sense to me more. He's saying, you trust God? Trust me too. Trust me. I'm going someplace and I need to prepare a place and then I'll come back for you. He says, stop letting your heart be so, con uh, so con it's concerned. Excuse me. Believe, trust, have faith. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's not using his carpenter skills to go build a house. The, the, the translation of their, in my father's house are many mansions. Are kind, it's kind of a mistranslation because actually what it says is there's, there's many places, many dwelling places. Essentially, what he's saying is that in my father's house, you know, the song is a big, big house. That's basically what it's saying. It says, there's a lot of space for you all. It's not going to fill up. And there's for you. I'm going to prepare a place. And how is he preparing that place? He's preparing that place by going to the cross. He's looking to the cross. He's saying, this thing that you're fearing is taking me to the cross. And that's how I'm preparing that place for you. And his destination his destination is and this is kind of semantics. Sometimes we as Christians, we talk a lot about going to heaven. You want to go to heaven, but pray, you know, accept Jesus Christ. And who, okay. 
Do you know the Bible doesn't really talk about going to heaven as much as it talks about going to be with God, with the Father? Maybe we need to shift our thinking, shift our brains. You know, everything has to do with being with the Father, especially in this passage. Stop worrying and believe. Why? Because there's a lot of room in my Father's house. Someday, we will be there because he's preparing a way for us. Jesus says, I will be with the Father, and you will be with me. And where's Jesus? He's with the Father. And so we're going to be with the Father. Jesus, the is more focus is not on a place, but the focus is with your with whom you're with. So to summarize that section. Next slide, please. Or next click. To summarize that section, says Jesus must go away. There we go. Jesus must go away to make a way for them and us to join Jesus in his father's house. That's why Jesus is going away. The most devastating news the disciples could possibly hear becomes the best news the world could possibly receive. If he can take the greatest evil this world has ever experienced and turn it into the greatest good the world has ever seen, then he can take your circumstances and turn it into, the, into good. You may still need to go through some of the pain, some of the experience, but trust him. He has already worked it out. Paul says in Romans, all things work together for good to them that love God. So believe. Believe. So the next question comes from Thomas. Jesus says, and you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas says, uh, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. There we go again, to the Father, not to heaven. Uh, again, semantics, but it's fo uh, important focus. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. I would have been so frustrated if I was Jesus. If I was Jesus, I'd probably go, <laughs> okay, let me spell this out clearly. I am the way. I've been saying this. How long do I need to say this? I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is definitely more patient than I. So this is Thomas's question. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? He's like, Lord, just give me a GPS of your location and I'll go. I'll get there. Give me a map. Give me something so I can get there. To which Jesus says, no, there's no map. It's me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know what? I've been with you for three years. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The way. He's the way to, the, to union with the Father through the cross and resurrection. He is the only way. No one gets to the Father except through him. Where is Jesus going? He's going to the Father. Chapter 14 is all about going to the Father. We put, uh, like I said before, we put far too, in from, too much emphasis on the place and not enough emphasis on the company that we're going to have in the place. Jesus longed to be with his Father. And he longs for us to be with his Father. 
I have two dogs, little dachshunds, Chloe and Chicha. And all they want to do is be with us. Anywhere we are, they want to be. Dawn sits at the table on her computer. They sit there and whine until she, they can jump up and lay down on the chair next to her. Um, we go to the kitchen. They're there at our feet. I think there's ulterior motives to that one. But still, um, we go to the bedroom, and they, they're there. They come. They follow us. Um, I had a picture. I didn't share it because I thought it would be a distraction. But I went out last night uh, for a short run, and Dawn took a picture. My dog was just sitting there at the front door waiting for me to come back. When you go to the bathroom, you don't even get privacy in the bathroom. You got to make sure that door clicks. Otherwise, they push it open and they come and sit at your feet. They All they want is to be with us. No matter where we are. Do you just want to be with Jesus? Is that your desire, inner desire is to be with Jesus wherever he is? It doesn't matter if it's in heaven here on earth, doesn't matter if you're in pain or suffering, as long as I'm with Jesus, it'll be okay. He is the way. He is the way to the Father through the cross and the resurrection. He is the truth. For he is the revelation of the Father who reveals the word and the will of God. Hebrews 7, I mean, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us. And the, actually the gram, grammar there says, in his son. Not by his son in his son, meaning his son was God's word to us. Everything he said, everything he did was God's word to us. And he says about his son, about Jesus. He was appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high next to his father. In a word, in a world where your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. If I don't want to be a boy anymore, I don't have to be a boy anymore. If I can be whatever I want. Hold on to the, the true truth. Hold on to Jesus. He is the standard creator, author of truth. Nothing, you know, there's a saying that, uh, that all truth is God's truth. I don't I don't necessarily like that saying because what it's saying is anything I decide is truth is actually God's truth. No, it's the only truth is God's truth. The only truth is God's truth. Jesus and the Father are one, and them, they with the Holy Spirit are creator, sustainer, and comforter. God decides or defines reality, not us. If we want to be sh uh, sure of the truth about this world, about the people in this world, about the animals in this world, about the things in this world, we need to know the author and sustainer of this world. If, if, if sci the scientists who don't know Jesus can only try to figure out what's going on, but how can you figure out exactly what's going on if you don't know the author and the creator of what's going on? There's always going to be a hole, always going to be something missing. So he is also, oh, wrong button, the life. 
the life. For he is the embodiment of the life of the Father who gives life and resurrection to us. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He rose from the dead. He is the very author of life. Through the cross, he defeated death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? He is life itself. Thomas says, how can we know the way? The good news is the way is Jesus. Jesus is the way. How do we get on the way, the correct path to the Father? Believe. Believe in Jesus. The only way to where Jesus is going is through Jesus himself. The only way to be with the Father for eternity is through Jesus. The only way is Jesus. You need to know Jesus. A couple of things I want to just quickly bring out in this passage. Um, Jesus says, There's two words. Let me just say this. There's two Greek words used in this passage for the idea of know, to know. Oida and gnosko. Oida is, the, is head knowledge. It's book knowledge. It's knowing from studying. So. And gnosko is a deeper knowledge. It's really in, you know, in, internalizing, in, uh, internal knowledge. It's, uh, so you could say it's heart knowledge. We'll say it that. In verse 4, Jesus says, you know where I'm going, oida, head knowledge. Thomas says, we do not know, head knowledge, where you are going, and we do not know, head knowledge, the way. And then in verse 7, Jesus says, if you had known me, gnosko, you would have also, gnosko, known my father. There are a lot of people in this world, and probably in this room, who only oida Jesus. They grew up in a Christian home, in a church that may not have emphasized the, the need to really know Jesus. You have a knowledge of Jesus. You know all the information about Jesus. You know what church is like. You know everything. And you're like the Pharisees. You think you got it. You have this, you, you know more. I used to have this friend. He could tell me all this trivia about the Bible. What's the middle verse? What's the very first word? What's the very last word? He had all, how many words are in the Bible? How many verses? He could tell me this, all of this stuff, but he didn't really know Jesus, but he knew a lot of stuff. Do you oida Jesus? Do you know him at a surface factual level? God says, Satan knows Jesus, and he fears, and he trembles, but he doesn't bow his knee. Satan, Satan wants nothing. No, let me, let me rephrase that. Satan's favorite thing to do is to make you to believe that you're okay. That you Know Jesus, and you're okay. You don't have to really know Jesus. You know Jesus. Because it keeps you separated from Jesus. And even though you know Jesus, you're still going to eternal suffering. You're still going to die apart from Jesus. Many will come to me in that day. And says, Jesus, did we not know you? Did we not do miracles in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never really knew you. You need to know Jesus deeply. If you need to know Jesus deeply, please talk to one of us. Elders, we have these name tags. Uh, deacons have name tags. Um, if, if, if you don't see one, ask someone, hey, where's one of the elders? And they'll point, point us out to you. We'll be up, up front after a service. Other theme is this idea that John 
expands on throughout his, his passage, um, starting with actually the very beginning. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made. When you replace the name Jesus in there, because we know the word is talking about Jesus, because it says in verse 14 that the word became flesh and dealt with us. So let's, in the beginning was Jesus, and, the, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. And Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as, the, as of the only Son from the Father. Here's a simple logic statement. He talks about the word. He talks about the word is God. He talks about the word. He talks about the word is Jesus. And so, therefore, we know that Jesus is God. The Father and the Son are together. Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son. And he spends most of chapter 14 explaining that. And we're just going to read a little bit of that later. So, the last, last question. The last question. We're just going to quickly go through this last. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And I've debated about this. And maybe, maybe one of the other elders can come correct me on this. Perhaps, perhaps Philip is saying, Jesus, you don't need to die. Just show us the Father. You can still be with us. Perhaps that's what he's saying. I don't know. But we know Philip is like, show us the Father. And now Jesus is like, ayah, ayah. I've been with you for three years now. And I've been telling you, I and the Father are one. We're the same. And yet you say, show us the Father. What in the world is going on here, Philip? And he continues. I'm just going to let Jesus speak here. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works. Isn't it interesting? He says, believe on the, he says that all the works that I've done are from my Father. Then he says, if you can't believe that I'm with the Father, believe the works that my Father has done through me. Then later on, we're going to talk about this, but he says that if you believe him, you'll do these works more. And he's not talking about miracles. He's talking about glorifying his Father. Talk about glorifying his Father. So, Let's, let's look at the question again. We said, how do you find peace when everything is crumbling around us? Through the cross. Through the empty tomb. Peace that passes all understanding is found in the way, the truth, and the life. It's found in Jesus. It's the only place we can find peace. I'm going to leave you with a bumper sticker. This is the bumper sticker. Father God, I thank you for your love and your, that we have, we can have peace through you, not through our efforts, through you, through our knowing our true knowledge of you. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that your peace that passes all understanding would rest on us. That when we're anxious and we're worried and we're concerned, that we would remember to stop, not let our hearts be troubled. 
just to trust you because you have got it. You've got the end figured out already. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.